disputes have yet to be resolved. There are huge questions being asked about the police investigation, not to mention the deal that Bernardo tried to strike with the Crown. And to talk about this, we're joined outside the Toronto courthouse by Globe and Mail reporter Kirk Macon and CTV legal analyst Alan Young. Good morning, both of you. Good morning. Kirk, I don't know how this story could get any more tragic, but now we find out that police missed a series of opportunities um, to detect Bernardo before he embarked on the uh, kidnappings and rapes of Christian French and Leslie Mahaffey. Yeah, I, I guess I should just start with the usual proviso that uh, hindsight is twenty twenty, and it was an intense investigation. There were leads all over the place. But having said that, uh, there were tips coming in as early as uh, 1989, 1990, uh, from, from women, for example, in the Scarborough area who were giving descriptions of, uh, of the man who had raped them, the Scarborough rapist. The descriptions were a good match for him. There were actual tips to police to look at this guy, Bernardo. Uh, he's sexually bizarre. Uh, a former girlfriend said that he, was, uh, that he basically raped her and used a ligature at, at least one occasion. Uh, a bank teller said he looked like a composite. He was one of the customers at the bank. She said he looked like the police composite published in the paper. Eventually, the police had him in and had saliva, blood, and hair samples taken from him uh, in 1990. And for reasons that aren't entirely clear, it was a couple of years before they were actually analyzed properly for DNA and pointed directly at him. We also had incidents of stalking in the St. Catharines area, even while Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French were going missing, which weren't properly followed up. Well, in fact, uh, you report this morning that one woman uh, was stunned three days after uh, Christian French was abducted to see uh, the car of a man who had been stalking her and followed him. Yeah, it's actually even more chilling than that because it, it was while Kristen French was still in the Bernardo home being held. And that night, it was a Saturday night of Easter weekend, 1992, Bernardo went out to get fast food. And on his way back, this woman who had been stalked by him earlier saw him again, turned her car around, followed him, and got within about 30 seconds of his house before she lost him. Nonetheless, she reported the license plate and the, and the make of the car, but it wasn't followed up. Uh, his defense counsel, John Rosen, has said that this is something that the police are going to be called to account for. Well time will tell whether they are or not. I mean, it's, it's, it is the kind of scenario where we often, thank God, do see a, a, an, a, an inquiry called into what went wrong so we can find out what to do next time. In, a, in this case, I think a lot of things are obvious that should have been done and should be done next time, but there's got to be an airing of this. One hope there, hopes there will be. Now, we hear also um, that Bernardo had offered to plead guilty uh, for second, to second-degree murder charges. Uh, yes, his, uh, there was a lot of, uh, of back and forth last night between the lawyers on the case, the lawyers for the family and, uh, and the, uh, the, who have a, little, a civil action going now, uh, saying that Bernardo used the tapes as a bargaining chip to try and induce them uh, to, to get it to uh, the Crown to accept a uh, second degree murder plea by Bernardo. And Bernardo's lawyers are saying that, uh, that they, they did talk to the Crown uh, and they got nowhere. They made a good offer on behalf of Bernardo, although they say Bernardo did not directly know they were doing it, uh, and, and the Crown just held very firm. The suggestion was what? Uh, that uh, the court wouldn't have to, or the trial wouldn't have to be held, that people wouldn't have to be exposed to these videotapes if he uh, could strike a plea bargain. That's right. The, the big inducement would be the, the agony of these videotapes appearing in court and being seen possibly by the public. Uh, and, and the media that it would never take place. Alan, uh, yes. perhaps the biggest bungle of all was police not finding those videotapes and uh, Ray Houlihan, the crown in this, has said that if those tapes had been found, Carla Homolka would also have been in the dock. Most definitely. Um, you're a lawyer specializing in criminal appeals. Do you think that um, she should be retried? Well, let me explain it this way. In July, I wrote to the Attorney General, Charles Harnick, and requested that he give serious consideration to appealing her sentence. Everyone knows 12 years is a travesty of justice. The question is, can you unravel the deal? Now, usually a deal should stick. But if she perpetrated a fraud on the system, if she misled the Crown, then that would give a window of opportunity for the Court of Appeal to say, this deal can be overturned. Let's now look at what sentence she should get. I think it's a possibility. I think it's something this government should be explored, but it may be legally untenable. I don't know yet. Have you heard back from the Attorney General yet? Not yet, but that is something I believe 
he would wait until the verdict comes in. I expect that they have their legal officers looking at this, but you have to understand, they have to hire independent counsel because the Crown Law Office is party to this deal. So they're going to have to hire a lawyer from the outside to look at this, but I've heard nothing as of yet. Now, you mentioned in your letter to the Attorney General that uh, you have talked to hundreds upon hundreds of people over the course of this trial, and really this is the only issue that uh, they keep bringing up. Most definitely. Whenever I speak to anyone out here, no one asks about Paul Bernardo's fate. Everyone simply assumes that he's going to be convicted. Every person comes up to me and says, what about Carla Hamalka? How can we allow someone to be released at the age of 35 when she's responsible for at least three deaths? Now, my position was that when she was sentenced, she did not tell the court about her involvement with other minors. She, in fact, was acting to procure young women to come to the house for Paul Bernardo. She did not reveal that information, so her 12-year sentence doesn't reflect the extent of her wrongdoing. You also have concerns about uh, the case itself, whether it might in fact be thrown out. Well, I always have those concerns because I'm an appeal lawyer, but let me preface my comments by saying I have the utmost respect for Justice Lesage. I think he did an admirable job, but his charge was not a model of perfection. There are numerous errors in there. Now, I don't know if you can overturn a case of this nature where there's overwhelming evidence, but something happened yesterday which disturbed me, which was that counsel went into chambers to discuss the charge in the absence of Mr. Bernardo. He has a constitutional right to be present during vital portions of the trial. That's a jurisdictional defect. It could be very difficult for the Court of Appeal to cure that. Thank you both uh, for joining us this morning. Amid angry protest, Carla Hamolka drove away with just a 12-year sentence because police didn't find crucial evidence. For a full 10 weeks, forensic detectives turned the Bernardo home upside down and inside out. They looked behind walls and dug up floors. But they couldn't find the videotapes that showed Bernardo and Hamolka assaulting their young victims. Narcotics officers, they can go into a house and in two hours find a gram of cocaine this big hidden under the floorboards. How the police could not find these particular tapes, six video cassettes about this size each, is inconceivable. It is pure incompetence. Would there have been a crown deal with Miss Amalka had they had the videotapes? I, I doubt it. I think everyone doubts it. Bernardo says he hid the tapes above a ceiling pot light. After the police search, his former lawyer, Ken Murray, retrieved them. Provincial police were asked to investigate why he didn't hand them over for 16 months. With no tapes, prosecutors needed Homolka even more as their star witness. They cut a deal that critics say was too rushed and too sweet. There was enormous pressure because the police issued a press release saying we have the murderer, but they had no case. So they had to quickly wrap up their negotiations with Homolka. They were desperate. I'm prepared to say we break the deal. It's that simple. Many Ontario MPPs, like Chris Stockwell, are pressing for Hamolka to be retried or resentenced. Simply 12 years is absolutely categorically unacceptable after hearing about the heinous and, and sickening crime that she participated in. It's unacceptable. If we can point to numerous instances where Hamolka misled the police, in negotiating her deal, that may give the Attorney General a slight opening. But this law professor says the deal was set in concrete by the courts. It was turned into a judgment. The judgment is now binding. The time for appeal has passed. It seems to me that as certainly as regards Mahaffey and French, it couldn't be reopened even if it should be. Along with Homolka's sentence, the police pursuit of Bernardo is also under scrutiny. Step after step after step seems to be a misstep. Author Stephen Williams has chronicled what he calls a shoddy investigation still plagued by unanswered questions. Example, could Bernardo have been arrested sooner on charges he now faces for a series of rapes in Scarborough in the late 80s? As a suspect, he gave DNA samples in 1990 before the schoolgirl murders. It took two years to get a final DNA analysis, a delay blamed on police and on backlogs at the lab. Example, did police put too much faith in a... Canada's most sensational murder trial will finally get underway later today. Nearly two years after his arrest, Paul Bernardo will appear in a Toronto courtroom, charged in the gory sex slangs of two Ontario teens 
and there has been a great deal of speculation about this case. To tell us more, uh, to help us speculate, maybe to help uh, enlighten as to what will unfold over the uh, weeks to come, we are joined outside the courthouse by two people who will be providing regular analysis for CTV, psychologist and lawyer Nancy Lands and lawyer Alan Young. Good morning Hi. to you both. Good, Good morning. morning. Um, Help us out here. What should we expect day one? It's taken a long time to get here. There has been reams written about it. Canadians have been inundated with media reports. Um, a lot of it, of course, because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what uh, the attorneys have. Uh, what's going to happen day one? Well, I think expect the unexpected. I don't think too much will happen today. There's still a lot of logistical matters to get through. I think the jury is just going to be sent home to fill out a questionnaire. What we're going to discover is we discover with the O.J. Simpson matter that law moves in a very slow, snail-like fashion. <laughs> we probably won't hear anything for three weeks. And with a publication ban, that means that people will not really know what the details of this case are for probably three weeks. Yeah. Nancy, what about a plea? Well, what do we expect here? Well, um, there are two possibilities that I see at this, t at this time. Um, the insanity defense is one possibility, but there's another alternative here, and that is Bernardo may, uh, and his lawyers may say that he just didn't do it, and it may be uh, something that uh, murders that he wants to pin on uh, someone else, possibly Carla Hamolka. So there are two uh, options that I see viable at this time. Mm -hmm. Actually, Dan, there's probably a third option which is that Mr. Bernardo may admit complicity in some of the other offenses, the lesser offenses like the kidnapping and the assault, but deny having involvement with the homicide, and we enter the wonderful world of recriminations where he's going to point the finger at his wife and his wife's going to point the finger at himself. Sometimes coming clean and admitting to complicity in some acts makes the jury uh, see you as more believable. So mm -hmm. that's a possibility too. Well, now, it, I also think that, that that could be possible because the prosecution might be introducing a videotape. We hear of it, but we don't know for sure. Uh, we don't know what the evidence is until the judge rules on it. And if that's the case, and if he is involved in that videotape uh, in the sexual assaults, then he, that may be the way he has to go. Mm -hmm. What do you expect will happen with these tapes? Overall, what I expect will happen? <laughs> well, you know, we're all in the dark here. Because of the publication ban and we don't have reciprocal disclosure where the defense has to tell us what the defense is, the chances are we really don't know what will happen. And I can't comment on evidence that I'm aware of that's covered by the publication ban. All we know is the trial is scheduled for two to three months. This key witness is Carla Hamalka. Mm -hmm. The Crown will do everything possible to corroborate her evidence, to make her credible, because she's coming to the stand as an unsavory witness, as an accomplice. So that's what the focus of the trial will be, is rehabilitating her credibility. Other than that, I can't really comment because of the publication ban. Nancy, what about jury selection? Uh, we went through weeks of this with the OJ thing. Apparently in this country, uh, the lawyers are really limited in what they can ask potential jurors. Well, that's right. The O.J. Simpson case had about six weeks of jury selection. We're expecting that this case will have about three weeks of jury selection, which is half that in the O.J. Simpson case. Um, but it's also true that questioning is very likely going to be limited by the judge. We are not able here in Canada to ask extensive questions about past experiences and attitudes. Um, so we're going to uh, look at demographics associated with jurors, for instance, what job they have, etc. But not much beyond that. Um, and, um, and Yeah, but when the attorneys are doing this, uh, what is it they're trying to find out really? The jury... I, I mean, are they trying to get a gut feeling for what, what this person's like? Well, that's right, yes. The attorneys, the implicit um, agenda is to find jurors that will side with um, with their side. So the defense is looking for jurors that may be defense prone, prosecution looking for jurors that are prosecution prone. They're supposed to be looking for impartial jurors, but that doesn't really always end up being the case. Yeah, the, the stated objective is impartiality, but everyone's looking for a favorable jury. Uh, it's really much ado about nothing in a lot of ways. They'll spend two, three weeks trying to understand the jurors in front of them, but they're very limited in what they can find out about the jurors, so it's really just educated guesswork. Alan, what about Patrick uh, Lesage, the judge? How big a factor is he going to be in terms of his personality and what he's done before and his attitudes in building strategies for both the prosecution and the defense? In, in a jury trial, the judge is supposed to be a neutral umpire, should not be involved. Though when he instructs the jury, his opinion will come out very clearly and it will influence the jury. But quite frankly, the best judge for a jury trial is one who sits back and lets the case unfold by itself. Is that what we're going to get in this case? I would hope so. 
Nancy, what about putting Paul Bernardo on the stand himself? Uh, that decision's really made um, ultimately by him. Uh, how good an idea is that in a trial of this type? And what's the relationship that someone accused like this has with the jury? Well, Dan, you're right. It's a decision um, that the suspect and the defendant in this case has to make, but it's also a decision that he's likely going to make with his lawyer um, or lawyers. We don't know if he's going to take the stand, and I don't even know if he knows, and the lawyers know in this case, whether or not he's going to take the stand. This may be a decision made at the 11th hour uh, and is part of the legal strategy, so we're just going to have to wait and find out what happens. Mm -hmm. Now, does this whole thing hinge on whether or not Carla Homolka is a credible witness? Because uh, Alan mentioned earlier that she is an unsavory witness. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, what that means is she's already admitted some degree of complicity in this because she's been convicted. So she's an accomplice in the matter, and it would appear that she has every reason to lie to save her skin. This is a very standard matter in criminal trials where someone who's involved becomes a crown witness and they're attacked a full frontal attack on their credibility right. and the Crown must do everything to corroborate her evidence and I assume the forensic evidence, the videotape, whatever is on there will be entered to corroborate her testimony. How far, uh, how long is it you think before we start hearing testimony? Two, three weeks perhaps, it's really hard to say. Jury selection can move very slowly or they could pick a jury in one day, it's not unheard of. <laughs> well it's been a delight talking to you two and uh, we'll be speaking I think very frequently good. over the course of the trial. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with us, Canada AM will be right time. And to help in understanding its complexities, we'll be joined regularly by Dr. Nancy Lands, forensic psychologist and lawyer, and Alan Young, a lawyer who is an expert in criminal trial procedures. I talked with them earlier and first asked Dr. Lands whether it was realistically possible to find impartial jurors. Well, it's going to be the case that the jurors all have some kind of conceptions about what's going on in this case. I mean, there's just been a splash of media attention all over the place, and there's no way that very many people are going to have escaped learning about this Bernardo trial. But even though they come to court with their conceptions and maybe misconceptions, the jurors will very likely be able to put aside a lot of their attitudes about whether or not they think Bernardo's innocent or guilty. And they're, they're capable of doing it. The judge is going to ask them to do it. And I think that they'll be viable jurors and able to sit on the jury. So what's on for tomorrow? Well, tomorrow is significant because the arraignment takes place. The arraignment is the process whereby the charges are read out and Paul Bernardo will plead to them. We'll find out whether he even pleads guilty tomorrow, but I doubt that will happen. But we'll find out whether he pleads not guilty to all the charges and puts the crown to strict proof, or whether he pleads guilty to TV news with law. Today, our legal expert, law professor Alan Young, moved outside the Ontario Court of Justice building in downtown Toronto, where I talked with him late this afternoon. Alan, does this plea, not guilty on all counts, come as a surprise? Most of the people entering the courtroom today in the media seem to be influenced by rumors that Mr. Bernardo would plead guilty to some of the offenses, and he didn't. It just goes to show that in a case like this, which is shrouded in secrecy, we have to learn to expect the unexpected, and most of our speculation is somewhat unfounded and uninformed. Well, now, as we know, there's always more in law than meets the eye. So what is the defense actually doing with this not guilty plea? The not guilty plea tells us very little, except it's the defense telling the Crown, prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. No concessions are made, no admissions are made, and we have no idea whether or not they're going to present evidence relating to a recognized offense like alibi or mental disorder, or whether they're going to simply poke holes in the Crown's case, show inconsistencies and deficiencies. We'll just have to wait and see. Is this not guilty plea cast in stone, or can the defendant change it down the road? No, it's unique to our system that an accused can plead guilty at any stage of the proceedings, even when the jury is deliberating. In our system, the Anglo-Canadian-American system, an accused person is the master of his or her own fate. Unlike the European system, where they don't even ask someone, do you plead guilty? They don't care if someone thinks they're guilty. They want to know, can the state prove their case? And this explains why our system is dominated by plea bargaining, and the European system is dominated by a trial system. Good thing to know as we come into this trial. Thanks very much, Alan. Thank you very much. Joined by lawyer Alan Young. Good morning, Mr. Young. Good morning. Well, after three years of publication bans, will we be finally hearing today some of the horrendous details of what the uh, Crown, what the police think happened here? I think so. In fact, outside the courtroom here today, it's quite chilly, and I think we're going to hear some chilling details in the opening statement. 
This is the opportunity the Crown has to provide the jury with an overview of its case. Originally, they said they're going to take a day and a half, which suggests there'll be a lot of detail, but I think it'll be shorter than that. But finally, the public will get a sense of what this case is all about. I must remind you, it is not evidence. The Crown must still prove these allegations, but finally, we will have an understanding of what the case is against Paul Bernardo. Uh, is the court, is the judge going to be able to avoid the kind of media carnival, including scrums before and after, the sort of anger and bitterness that developed between lawyers that's all happened at the O.J. Simpson trial and which has offended so many people? Oh, most definitely. We, we have a British tradition here, which is much more deferential to authority. South of the border, they seem to overstate everything. They make a party out of everything. Canadian courts don't have this tradition of posturing like the American courts do, so I don't believe we're going to see the type of circus that we've seen down south. Is it legal for, for lawyers on both sides to give interviews summing up how they think they did that day afterwards? Will a judge permit that sort of thing to go on? I'm not sure the judge has any control over that. It's within the discretion of a lawyer, but a lawyer cannot argue his or her case with the media. They must do it in a court of law. So there are limits to what they can say outside of the courtroom. How do you think the public is going to react when the really horrendous details of this trial apparently uh, be, be, become known? I mean, is this the end of a sort of Canadian innocence, if you like, in terms of crime? Oh, no, no. We've had horrific crime in Canada. We can't say that we haven't. But we haven't had much serial killing, and this case has the hallmarks of serial killing. The only real serial killer we've known is Clifford Olson, and he pled guilty, so we don't know the details. So the public will be somewhat shocked if the Crown's case is as horrific as they claim it to be. But I think we've had serious crimes in this country before. We're only going to hear, as I understand it, the Crown's opening statement today and perhaps tomorrow. We're not going to be hearing from the defense. Is that as expected, and what difference does that make? That's quite normal. Defense is not entitled to make an opening statement at the outset of the trial. Though under the Charter of Rights, many defense lawyers have argued that it's manifestly unfair not to get some sort of say at the beginning because first impressions are very important. But it's within the discretion of the trial judge, and Justice Lesage said no, so that's what we have. Considering the three years of pre-trial publicity, uh, and considering the fact that Bernardo's uh, former wife has already been convicted for manslaughter, is it going to be an uphill struggle for his lawyers to try and prove his innocence? Oh, most definitely. But they don't have to prove his innocence. Remember that. The Crown must prove Mr. Bernardo's guilt. But it will be an uphill battle. But I can tell you they're very competent lawyers, and they'll do the best they can. Finally, has there ever in Canadian history been a, a criminal trial that's gotten such sensational attention as this one? Never. Perhaps the Demeter trial in the 70s came close, but I've never seen such scrutiny of a trial, and it makes it very difficult to conduct a trial for the lawyers, for the public, for everyone. We shall see over the next three months how this all goes. ...expert at the Bernardo trial, Professor Alan Young of Osgoode Hall Law School, and asked him how he would characterize the Crown's opening statement. Well, at the commencement of his opening statement, he characterized an opening statement as a brief synopsis or a thumbnail sketch, but it was anything like that. In fact, it was a litany of abuse and horror told in painstaking and often painful details. However, he did remind the jury on a number of occasions that this is not evidence, and it will be up to them to decide whether the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt this litany of horror and abuse. Now, we, the opening statement went on for a whole day. Is that usual? No, usually an opening statement is mu much briefer than this. In complex circumstantial cases, you'll find the Crown will map out in great detail their case. It wasn't necessarily important in this case for him to do it, but perhaps he felt it was necessary to dispel all the speculation about the Crown's case, because basically we've heard nothing for two and a half years. What happens next now? What happens next is they'll start calling witnesses, but I would imagine that for a week, we're not going to see anything too dramatic. They'll simply set the scene. They might call witnesses to explain the geography of St. Catharines, things like that, simply to get the jury comfortable with the whole concept of listening to evidence. Okay, Alan Young, thank you very much. Thank you. Outlined the case, describing in graphic detail how Bernardo abducted, tortured, and killed teenagers Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. Uh, to talk about this uh, at the courthouse in Toronto is lawyer Alan Young and Globe and Mail reporter Kirk Macon. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Now, Alan Young, why did the opening statement take as long as it did? I mean, presumably to just outline the case, you know, Ray Houlihan could have done it more succinctly. Why do you think he, he explained it in such detail? 
Well, it is the Crown's prerogative to take an hour or to take two days. Perhaps the Crown thought with all the rumors and speculations that have abounded in this case that he finally wanted to set the record straight. Here is our case every detail. Put aside all the rumors you've heard. This is the case. Or perhaps he wanted to leave a, a very lasting impression, which I must say he did. Mm -hmm. And Kirk, you know, what was the reaction in the courtroom? Um, you weren't there for the Homolka trial, but you've covered many, many trials, including Guy Paul Moran's. Well, I think, uh, I guess stunned is one of the uh, less inadequate words you can use. And one of the problems with a case like this, and there is really no precedent that I know of for a case this gruesome, is that words can't convey what's going on. You just, you sit there and it's inconceivable what you're hearing. And that's sort of the feeling that pervaded the courtroom throughout it. And I'm sure that's what the jury was thinking. And people just looked into each other's eyes and thought, is this really true? Could members of our species really have done what's alleged in this case? I should say that just before we got here, Kirk and I were talking and commenting on how both of us didn't get a, a lot of sleep. And we've been around criminal trials for a long time. There was something very dramatic and pressing about the nature of these allegations, which affected both of us. Well, and you know, you did hear stories of, of people at the Homolka trial weeping, people who'd covered trials for years, you know, law enforcement officers, that it's unbearable. Well, we haven't had a lot of experience with this type of homicide. Clifford Olson is the best example, but he pled guilty and we didn't know the details. So it may be that Canada is not simply experienced in hearing these types of serial killings. Okay, two things, Alan, particularly. Um, Ray Houlihan spent a lot of time going into the definition of first-degree murder and a lot of time talking about, I guess, Carla's credibility and how abused she was. These are obviously critical things to him. Well, with respect to the first-degree murder charge, what the Crown will have to prove is that Paul Bernardo intended to cause death or meant to cause bodily harm that he knew was likely to cause death, that will satisfy second degree. To elevate it to first, they're going to have to show that it's either planned and deliberate or that the killing was caused during the commission of sexual assault or unlawful confinement. That will get it up to first degree murder, which is our most serious offense. Mm -hmm. and, and regarding Carla's credibility? The whole case turns on it, but of course they have forensic evidence, they have videotape evidence. What this case is about is letting her tell her story and then using the rest of the evidence to corroborate her story. Mm -hmm. And Kirk, you know, when, when you heard all this detailed, again, most of it coming, I guess, from, from the testimony of Carla and, and what we can expect to hear through the trial from her. Well, there's a great deal more detail uh, than people have heard previously. And, and you have to understand, it's one thing to hear things in theory or to hear them in rumor, to have them discussed in an office or even through police contacts or lawyer contacts. It's quite another to sit in a courtroom and hear the litany come out hour after hour in extreme detail to have the families of the victims sitting just a few feet away and, and to watch what they must be going through, which is just hard to believe anyone could have to go through, to look across the room and see the person who's alleged to have done all this, to look at the jury that's going to have to hear all this, to have the prospect of these videotapes coming somewhere down the line, probably not very far. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's an incredible experience. No, I mean, you just you can't bear what the families must be going through. And they were, what, sitting up right in the front, weeping? Most definitely. It's difficult for everyone involved, but I, I must point out that this is simply the Crown's narrative. They haven't called any evidence, and we don't know what relationship there'll be between the statement and the evidence, so we must suspend judgment at this point. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, was there not, Kirk, a comment from one of the defense lawyers about you know, the, the families weeping too much? Well, it's... Uh, there, there's, there's a feeling, I think, in general, in criminal trials, that the family uh, can can have an effect on the jury, which is not always a proper effect. Lawyers often have concern about where they are in the courtroom. Whether or not that's the case in this case, we don't really know at this point. But, uh, you know, juries are, are, of course, attuned to the family of victims. They know they're there. They can't not know they're there. And so in what, a case what, did, like what this, did the defense lawyer say? Well, well, there's been nothing said. Uh, there's been nothing said in the courtroom with the jury there. At some point later in the trial, there may be. I guess we'll, we'll see. But I think they'll probably just take this as it comes. It's one of the things that's a given for a defense team. Families are going to be there, and if they're expressive uh, in their grief, and, and, and a lot of them are, how can they not be? It's just something they have to deal with. 
Now, Alan, what happens now? Do we know, do we move through the sort of forensic evidence first? I mean, at what point will Carla Homolka be called to testify? Well, we don't have a witness list, so we don't know, but I think they're going to see just contextualized evidence, evidence about St. Catharines, about where the bodies were found, evidence just to make the jury feel comfortable with the whole process of hearing evidence. There probably won't be anything dramatic for a week, maybe two weeks. Mm -hmm. And Kirk, I mean, again, the, there's been such a circus about this. People are saying, I hope it doesn't turn into anything like OJ. I mean, for the media covering this, what is the sense? Well, I think there's going to be a lot of, uh, of, of self-examination of what we are doing and are going to do now. It, it is so graphic. It is so ugly. Um, to turn it into a spectacle, I think, is going to... Is going to Judge, set the stage today for some of the most... We do not want the public to hear the sexually explicit tapes being played at the Paul Bernardo murder trial. Yesterday, they left the courthouse to avoid seeing or hearing tapes that shocked many of the people inside. Now, their lawyer is moving to appeal the ruling that lets the public hear what only the jury and court officials are supposed to see. Joining us now from outside the courthouse with more on that appeal is lawyer Alan Young. Good morning, Alan. Good morning. Uh, what's the procedure here, and uh, on what basis is this appeal being made? Well, it's somewhat complicated, especially for this time of the morning, but let me explain it this way. The families are not parties to the proceedings. They are third parties, but the Supreme Court of Canada has said that third parties can directly go to Ottawa, to the Supreme Court of Canada, to seek review of any decision at a trial that directly affects them. So that's what they're doing. Now, he wants a, a stay of ex execution. What exactly is well, that? Well, what that means is they want a stay of proceedings or a postponement of proceedings because the appeal is going to take months to perfect. And meanwhile, the trial is proceeding, and they want to stop the tapes from being played. So they have to stop the trial effectively until the appeal is heard. So to make the appeal meaningful, they apply for a stay of proceedings. Uh, Alan, I think that at the grassroots level, there is a lot of concern. There's a lot of sensitivity, I think, for Almost the so. families involved mm -hmm. here. I think many people reacted to um, the judge's initial ruling about hearing, not seeing, thinking, well, maybe that's a fair compromise. Uh, on what legal grounds, though, can an appeal be made to have that changed? On the basis that the judge erred in making a distinction between visual images and audio images. There's no doubt that it's a fine distinction and it's quite horrifying to hear the audio. And so the applicants here are saying the judge has effectively made an error by drawing that distinction. Dissemination of child pornography? That's an argument that they could raise, but a court is exempt from the normal rules of criminal law. They can show materials that would be considered obscene or pornographic in aid of a criminal trial. So I don't think that's necessarily a strong argument. Mm -hmm. Now, all that said, though, a stay of proceedings is rarely granted. Uh, go out on a limb. What are his chances here? It's very unlikely. This is a jury trial. If it was judge alone, there'd be a possibility. But you have to understand, it's going to take months. What is the jury to do for these couple of months? Go home, discuss the case with their family members, read the papers. They will be tainted in the process and compromise their impartiality. So in fact, it would be very unlikely to order a stay at this juncture. Now, I think there's some concern and there's a lot of confusion about the tapes. There were tapes played yesterday in court that everyone could not only hear but also see. What made these tapes different? These were, you could almost call them pornographic tapes of Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamalka. I was surprised that we got to see them, but then I realized they don't involve any of the victims or their families or anything like that. And the order of Justice Lesage was to protect the victims and their families. So there was nothing to prevent the Crown from showing the tape of Mr. Bernardo and Hamalka. When you say victims, is that the four victims? It, it would be Mahaffey, French, a woman only identified as Jane Doe, and Tammy Hamalka. So would Carla Homolka not qualify as family? Her status is somewhat confused. She's an accomplice. She's perhaps a victim. We don't really know what her role is right now. And so there is no publication ban preventing dissemination of the videos concerning her alone. Mm -hmm. Now, the families walked out yesterday, but they weren't the only ones. Uh, a lot of people walked out. Uh, what were you? What were your reactions to these tapes? Well, there's no question that sitting in a, in a courtroom, it's very macabre, it's very eerie. It's almost like a peep show to be sitting there and watching this. And it is difficult. I had difficulty seeing it a second time because they're showing the tapes three times, and I left after the first showing. Yeah. How would you describe the mood in the courtroom yesterday? It's tense. Of course it's tense. It's a very uncomfortable trial. The allegations are completely horrific, and we're starting to get to the, the heart of this case.
Mm -hmm. Is the Crown building a strong case in your, in, uh, in your feeling? It'd be best for me not to comment on the strength or weakness of the Crown's case, because ultimately that's a matter for the jury to decide. But the public is getting quite a bit of information, and I think they can make a determination for themselves about the nature of this case. Yeah. Now, based on these, the, the evidence presented by these tapes, if they're that horrific, is there the chance that the Crown will overplay its hand by playing these tapes too often? There's two possibilities. Either the jury will become so overwhelmed by the horror that they will despise or resent Mr. Bernardo. On the other hand, they may become desensitized to it. It becomes matter of fact after they see the tapes three times. I find it puzzling that they're playing the tapes so many times. It's almost like they have to hit the jury over the head to ensure they understand the significance of these tapes. Mm -hmm. Alan, we just have a couple of seconds. Yeah. Um, this attempt to get a stay of proceedings, when will we know? They whether will, or not it's successful. They will apply to the court for leave or permission probably next week, and we will know in a couple of days. We have to know in a couple of days. Thank you, sir. Thank you. From downtown Toronto, our legal expert, Alan Young. Alan, what do you assume to be the judge's reasoning behind this decision on the videotape? Well, like, courts have consistently said that publicity is the heart and soul of justice, but there can be compelling reasons why a judge may depart from that principle. In this case, the compelling reasons must relate to the emotional devastation the victim's family would feel seeing the tapes being played in public, tapes that are a permanent record of the last days of terror of their children. But as a legal person, what do you think is right or wrong about this decision? Well, what I think is good is that the criminal law has finally demonstrated that it can show some sensitivity and compassion to victims. What I think is bad is the public is being, being denied the opportunity now to independently assess the videotapes. The Crown did say in their opening statement that from the videotapes you'll be able to draw inferences about who was dominating, who was the prime mover, who was subordinate. Now the public will have to rely on the good sense of the jury for that. Yes, this sounds like a token gesture, if anything, in a way, because uh, the sound on these videotapes is often so poor that they're difficult to hear anyway. Is anything being done to correct that? Well, there is an audio enhancement, but what is puzzling is that the judge is, is not allowing access to the visual imagery, but to the audio imagery. So sporadically, we'll hear in court, whether it be screams, curses, expletives, totally out of context, and quite frankly, I don't think it'll be very helpful. Do you see this as precedent setting for future rulings on videotapes in this case? I don't think so. This is an extraordinary case, and extraordinary cases take extraordinary... You are watching... ...footage has been released but the public see the tapes that allegedly depict rape and torture. The judge in the Paul Bernardo murder trial ruled yesterday that the public can hear those tapes, but only the judge, the lawyers, the jury, and the accused need see them. To tell us more about this ruling, we are joined now in Toronto by Kirk Macon, a reporter with the Globe and Mail and lawyer Alan Young. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, Alan, let me start with you. Did this come as a surprise to you, this ruling? Oh, not at all. The criminal law has to start showing sensitivity and compassion for victims, and that's what happened here. You can imagine how devastating it would be for the families to sit and watch these videos in public. So I sort of had an inclination the judge would rule in this fashion. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of noise has been made by media outlets, Kirk, uh, including your newspaper, a lot of television as well. They, they didn't want this kind of an arrangement. However, no one seems to be appealing. Uh, what does this say to you? Well, I think it's part of, partially it's just pragmatic. It, who's going to try and stop this trial in the middle while they appeal this decision? It would be a ridiculous thing to try and do. But secondly, I think there's a recognition that this is more or less the worst scenario case. It's not the one you want to go to battle on these principles. If you can avoid it, they've lost the battle, but they've gained a partial victory. And I think that uh, most of the media can probably live with that. It's not what they wanted, but they realize the sensitivity of the case. and. Uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. It's time to quit. Alan, are we yeah. talking about a precedent here that's going to be used over and over again, or is this case uh, so different? Is this case unique, and this may not this happen This case again? is extraordinary, and therefore extraordinary measures have to be taken. We're not going to have many cases where the facts are the same. There has to be a compelling reason for the judge to override the principle of an open justice system, and I don't see that happening very often. Well, the sage did say that open justice can be adequately achieved this way. Do you agree with this? Half-half. I'm, I'm really of, of two minds on this. I think the public is deprived of the opportunity to view the videotapes and assess, in the Crown's words, who is the dominant force in this case. So we've lost that opportunity. But ultimately, I don't think it impairs the fair trial rights of Mr. Bernardo, and that's really the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Kirk, how have the families reacted so far? Well, the, the families of the victims, uh, uh, French and, uh, and Mahaffey, have 
there's, there's been a lot of, of weeping. Uh, there's been a lot of holding of hands. Uh, the Frenches are, are particularly stoic, and uh, they, they sit there and sort of take one blow after another as it comes. The Mahaffeys have been more overt in, uh, in their actions. They've walked across the courtroom uh, two or three times to block the only monitor that could be seen uh, from the body of the court when there are videos on. Not the videos that are being shown today that are so horrendous, but other videos in the case. And I might also mention that uh, the Homolka family, who are also victims here, uh, the parents and the other sister, uh, were in court during the testimony of the mother and sister. Uh, the parents sat at the front uh, when uh, Sister Lori was on. They too uh, looked, uh, they were very tragic figures. They held hands, they wept a little bit. I in a way, I mean, they're such a separate case. They're, they're the forgotten victims in this thing. They didn't ask for this to happen. Um, they, they're not part of applications not to show the tapes of their daughter Tammy uh, being raped uh, while unconscious and then dying shortly afterward. And I guess in a sense, there isn't all that much sympathy for them out there. People, you hear a lot of people say things like, well, how did, uh, how did Carla become this way? What influences in her home must be responsible for someone becoming what she became? And there's no answer for them to that, and they'll always be living with that. So they're the forgotten victims, I guess. The, the Tammy tape uh, will be viewed today in court now, and I'm wondering, it's being viewed not because it's part of the charges, but to establish the relationship yes. between Paul Bernardo yes. and Carla Homolka. But is it fair to ask of a jury, if this tape is as uh, horrendous as we've been led to believe from the Crown's opening address, is it fair to do that to a jury? That's our system. It happens very often in trial that the jury is told to disregard things or not to draw certain inferences. They're introducing this Hamalka tape as part of what they call unfolding the narrative to give a complete picture of the story. But the jury will be told not to draw any inferences about Mr. Bernardo's propensity for violence from the tape. How they can do that, I don't know. Yeah. I wonder about what the judge also said that the uh, picture has a greater impact often than the spoken word, than the written word. Uh, how do you react to that? I believe that. I believe that's the whole basis of cinema. And in fact, the spoken word that we're going to hear today is just going to come out sporadically. It will be quite meaningless. I think it'll be very eerie in the courtroom without the visual imagery. But there's no doubt in my mind that the visual imagery is more powerful. Mm -hmm. Kirk, you react the same way? Well, yes, I, I think there's, there's no escaping that. Um, and, and the eeriness, I, I've been trying to look ahead to what it's going to be like today. And uh, the, you, know, you have these thoughts go round and round in your head of hearing these disembodied voices suddenly coming out of nowhere asking for mercy or um, you, you know, so giving these scripted lines that uh, Bernardo and perhaps Homolka apparently uh, forced the, uh, the, the children they'd abducted to make. It's going to be a very, very strange, uh, unsettling experience, uh, both because it's happening and because these things are going to come out of nowhere with no visual context. With, with all due respect to the judge, I find this part of the judgment very puzzling. Uh, from the beginning of this case, people's imaginations have been running wild, and you know that if you sit and you hear certain audio uh, signals and you don't see the visual, your imagination takes over, and unfortunately the rumor and speculation will begin again. Thanks, Paul. Thanks very much. Thank you. Talk to you again. Stay with us. Mentioned by Steve Gandell joins us right now on the telephone from Toronto. Alan Young is a law professor at the Osgoode Hall Law School, and as you just heard, he is the only man, only person analyzing the Bernardo trial on a daily basis. Certainly, the only. Uh, the only lawyer, they don't call them attorneys, only lawyer in Canada uh, who is doing it. Now, Alan, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you go too far in your analysis because this program is seen in Canada, you can be held theoretically in contempt of that court? Most definitely. If I express any opinions about the guilt or innocence of Bernardo or the credibility of any witness, the judge could pull me into court, cite me for contempt, I'd be barred from going into the courtroom, and uh, that would be the end for me. The jury is not sequestered in the trial. Well, that's the problem. If the jury was sequestered, I could say whatever I want, but the fear is that my analysis or opinion could influence the jury, and that's why it's contempt of court. We, as a rule, do not sequester our juries. It's really like cruel and inhumane punishment. I think we see it in O.J. Simpson how much trouble they've had with these jurors living together virtually for a year. 
I, I totally agree. So without going into analysis, why don't you just tell us where we stand in this trial right now? Well, we're just about to finish the case for the prosecution. It's taken about three months to unravel. They've played videotapes of the sexual assaults, and they've had Carla... So the jury has seen those videotapes? Almost oh, definitely. The public was not allowed to see it. We could only hear the audio, which actually was quite eerie. But no, only the jury has seen the videotapes. They've heard the testimony of Carla Hamalka, who claims that her husband strangled both the girls. And now we're turning to the defense case, where Mr. Bernardo won't contest the fact that he assaulted these women, he kidnapped these women, but his claim will be that his wife actually killed the two young girls. So the, the wife, Carla, who the state has now made its own witness, he's alleging that she was the mastermind and he, what, the, uh, the unwitting uh, well, dupe or Well, oddly enough, he's going to say that he went out to get chicken or something like that. He came back and he found the girls dead. Presumably his theory would be that she killed them out of a jealous rage, perhaps, because he was using them as sex slaves, and perhaps she really couldn't live with the fact that his attention was directed towards these teenagers. So uh, I, I think one of the reasons the case is so sensational in that, in that sense in, in Canada is that these people, uh, uh, Bernardo and uh, Hamolka, seem so ordinary. They come from, uh, is it St. Catharines? Yes, uh, correct. Opposite <laughs> Ontario there, a little suburb, yes, very yes, sweet place? Yes, a very place. quiet suburb. Uh, in fact, it's more than that they're ordinary. They're very charming. In fact, they're a very good-looking couple. When I've seen videotapes, not the sex videotapes, but other videotapes of them together, I was thinking if I was their age, I'd like to have them around. They seem like very vivacious people. Uh, and yet the crime's almost unspeakably bizarre. In the Simpson case, we have a celebrity who is accused of committing what is an ordinary crime in the sense that uh, if the prosecution is correct, it was uh, domestic violence, mm -hmm. it was obsession, it was uh, this extraordinary man committing an ordinary crime. Yes. In Canada, you have ordinary people who've committed an extraordinarily uh, horrid crime. Yes, well, well, thankfully, predatory crime like this is few and far between, especially in Canada. Domestic violence is a far more significant problem, both in the United States and Canada. O.J. Simpson's case is somewhat pedestrian, almost, in the accusations, but the reason it's received so much attention is because who O.J. Simpson is. In the case in Canada, obviously, what they did, I mean, the, uh, Carla uh, admits bringing her 15-year-old sister to her own husband so he could rape her, uh, and then they, they gave her uh, halcyon and, and booze to knock her out, and then ultimately she suffocated on her own vomit. I mean, it's, it's just... Uh, and, and all captured on videotape. And all captured on videotape. And in the other case, when he had the two teenagers, the other two teenagers, is it true that he showed the third victim the suffering of the second victim? Most made her watch? In order to get her to comply with the least amount of resistance. This is a man who apparently was videotaping almost everything he was doing. He wanted to be, in his own words, larger than life. Ah. There's such a record of everything he's done from childhood on. Well, don't, uh, don't give us any more analysis, Alan. I don't want you uh, to be threatened with the same fate as Joe Bosco and <laughs> Tracy Savage. I've been skating on thin ice now for three months. I'm getting used to it. Okay, Professor Alan Young, thank you very much. Thank you. John the jury has packed it in for the night. CTV legal consultant Alan Young. Alan, what's going on? Well, obviously the jury has not reached a verdict in their first day of deliberations. Some jurors may be saying, look at the videotapes, they're horrifying, we can see what harm Bernardo can inflict, he must be guilty. But other jurors are probably saying, slow down, let's look at Hamalka's story, let's look at Bernardo's story. The assessment of credibility is very difficult. Bernardo was on the stand six days, Hamalka 17 days. Surely it's going to take more than a few hours to resolve that dilemma. So what is your best guess right now on a time frame for a verdict? Well, I always predicted they'd be in and out very quickly. I said it's an overwhelming case of first-degree murder, so obviously I'm wrong. I would expect a verdict by tomorrow, but I really couldn't say what time. Some people will be having a restless night. Most definitely. Thanks very much, Alan. Thank you. Again and again over the past three months, the jury was... ...where people are standing by awaiting the verdict. Um, CTV's legal analyst Alan Young is with us, and also uh, just hooking up now, I think may be able to hear us is Christy Blatchford, who is with the Toronto Sun, who's been covering the Bernardo trial. Let me first see if the, uh, it's working here. Christy, can you hear me? Alan, are you hearing me? I can hear you. There's some buses back here, so it's a little bit loud. Okay, Christy, maybe you can wave when you can hear me, and I'll ask, oh, there you are. And I I'll can hear you. Ask you a question. Well, Christy, let, let me start with you. I think, you know, people are starting to see much more of a profile uh, the personal side of Paul Bernardo coming out, evidence that the jury didn't hear. Um, what kind of a picture are we seeing today that's different than what the jury heard in the trial? 
Um, I'm not sure it's all that different. I think it's just more detailed. Uh, certainly his, uh, I guess his uh, criminal or alleged criminal behavior is uh, kind of uh, cutting a wider spectrum than the jury's heard. But uh, in terms of who he is and uh, the kind of uh, character he is, I think your viewers and listeners are, are just now seeing what the jury's been seeing for three months. I mean, this, this crazy guy uh, acting the way he does with his ability to change persona and, you know, kind of Perform, always performing, I think. I've, that's who we've been watching for three months. You've seen that. that so that the psychological profile, that rap song, those things don't surprise you at all? No, none of it does. I mean, some of the, the rap stuff that he wrote, of course, his own music wasn't allowed to be put before the jury, and uh, we all knew that it existed. Uh, the jurors haven't seen it, but I don't think that any of them would be particularly surprised by by much of the stuff that that they haven't heard. Uh, Alan, tell me about that evidence and, and why, why it wasn't allowed. Would it have made a difference? It probably would have made a difference, but what we do is we filter reality through the perspective of lawyers. We don't believe in having trials by character assassination. We want to know, did A do X to B? And we don't want to know what that person's propensity was because we're afraid it will prejudice the accused because it's overwhelming. If we knew that Paul Bernardo was stalking people on a daily basis, the jury would have trouble focusing on the one relevant question, did he kill these young girls? So we filter the reality. Unlike the Europeans, I let everything in and leave it to the good sense of their triers of fact. We keep it from the jury. We almost don't trust them how to deal with this evidence. One thing we're able to back up maybe and analyze now a little better is, did the publication ban at Carla's trial serve a purpose? It was quite controversial, some people thinking the Canadian justice system was antiquated, that jurors could make up their own mind based on what they heard in the courtroom and not what they'd heard before necessarily. Others saying this was the only way to get a clean, fair trial uh, for Paul Bernardo. Let me throw that first to Christy and then to Alan. Um, well, Alan and I may disagree on this, but uh, I mean, I don't think the, uh, the publication ban looks any better now than it did at the time. Um, I think that Paul Bernardo could have got a fair trial had there been no publication ban. There was an awful lot of publicity, given that there was a publication ban anyway. I mean, there were an awful lot of stories um, and, and a lot of rumors, a lot more rumors than there would have been if there had been no publication ban. So, uh, I mean, I don't think it served its purpose. I think the, uh, the jury was, would have been chosen perhaps not quite as quickly if there had been a lot more publicity. But I believe that it would have, the system would have worked as well mm -hmm. as it's working now, and I think it is working well now. Alan? I'd go further. I'd say it's counterproductive. Why we have this so-called media circus is because of the publication ban. This case has attracted more attention than it deserves. In my opinion, it was like a long, slow guilty plea. It was not a hotly contested who done it. And the only reason everyone's here and curious is because when the judge said, you can't hear about it, everyone wants to hear about it. Forbidden fruit. Right. And they're curious about two things now, obviously, the verdict, Alan Young, and what about Carla's deal? John Rosen said he thinks they can't change it, it would alter everything in terms of, of deals in the future. Do you have a quick answer on that? That's a fairly conventional perspective. We don't want to upset the process of plea bargaining, but the principle that would emerge is you only get a deal if you're forthright and frank, and I don't think that's a problem. I, th I think, too, that w I don't think that politicians or the political process should un attempt to undo what has been achieved in, a, in the courts or in a plea bargain, in other words, but I do think what there should be is some public accountability for the deal. Nobody in the Attorney General's office, including Michael Cole, who was here last night finally, has yeah. ever told us why they did it and what their rationale was. Yeah. Thank you both very much for being with us this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll be back on Canada. CTV legal consultant Alan Young. Alan, if this case does go ahead to appeal, what sort of chance does defense have to overturn the verdict? Well, Lloyd, we all hope the trial was conducted in a manner that will be appeal-proof. But as an appellate lawyer, I regret to say there were errors in the charge of the jury, errors with respect to the law of murder and with respect to party liability. And even yesterday, I saw what's called a jurisdictional error where submissions were heard about the charge in the absence of Mr. Bernardo. Ten years ago, that would have been an automatic new trial. But today, the Court of Appeal can look at the entire case and say there was no prejudice to Mr. Bernardo because of overwhelming evidence. And we know there was overwhelming evidence in this case. And therefore, I think an appeal will be an uphill battle for any lawyer. So if there is a new trial, does that mean the victim's families have to go through this all again, that we all line up to cover it again? I hope not. A court of appeal can only order a new trial, but then the AG can step in and say, let's go back to the table to negotiate a plea resolution. Nobody wants another four-month ordeal. Now, there was a feeling with this trial, Alan, that 
there were shifting sands here in public opinion. How did you read that from the legal side of things? Well, I think there was a loss of innocence for the Canadian public with respect to the legal system. They now realize there's no such thing as perfect justice. It's unattainable. Sometimes we have to compromise, and we call it plea bargaining. It was a travesty of justice to give Carla Hamalka 12 years, but we realize that sometimes we have to make these deals. But what the public must demand now is some accountability, because this is an underground practice. There are no rules, no criteria, no regulations. The public must demand some rules for immunity deals in the future. Alan, it's been great working with you these last several weeks, and you have done a wonderful job for us. We thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure, Lloyd.